Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks so much for joining us. As Mark Twain once said, rumors of our death or demise have been greatly exaggerated, along with rumors of certain ex-presidents' acquittals and things like that. <laughs> put, put no stock in any of them. In fact, put no stock in anything except what we're about to share with you. Professor Vanilia Randall, Professor Emerita from the University of Dayton School of Law with rich life experience in both the real hard work of nursing as well as many, many years of law struggling against adversity in forms that many of us can't even imagine. And Jay Fidel, who has also struggled against adversity for many, many years. The difference, of course, is that Unlike most of you, the three of us have not yet done it successfully. We're still struggling. <laughs> so here we are to invite you to join our struggle. And we're going to talk about what has been called diversity, equi equity, and inclusion, DEI. Professor Randall, you shared with us a perspective about diversity, equity, inclusion, that phrase, that acronym DEI. Tell us how you see it. What does it mean to you? Uh, thank you for inviting me and having me. And I have grown up with this, with uh, the struggle that the United States has had for racial inclusion. Um, I grew up in the segregated South and graduated from a segregated high school in 1966, notwithstanding Brown versus Board of Education. And every job and every schooling that I have had in my life, once I graduated from high school, I've been the only Black, often the first Black. Uh, yeah. And often the first person of color, not just the first Black. So part of the diversity, so affirmative, uh, clearly the first phase of getting rid of whites' uh, superiority in institutions was designated as affirmative action. And of course, there was a huge backlash to affirmative action. Uh, I remember when I was hired at the University of Dayton uh, as their first black faculty, I was confronted with students who petitioned against me because I was an affirmative action hire. Why was I affirmative action hire? Because I was a black person being hired. And so that by definition made me affirmative action hire. I have a lot of empathy for Thomas in this area. Even we're the same age and has gone through the same thing, but we, we've learned different lessons. His lesson was, if it wasn't for affirmative action, I would be where I'd want to be without anyone uh, putting in my face affirmative action. My lesson was, if it wasn't for affirmative action, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't have a job. Uh, and so, so, and so, the affirmative action was the first phase. Affirmative action was inadequate. So, people, the diversity, inclusion, and equity, especially in corporations, it was it was designed to be a way to make corporate entities not only more diverse, but more inclusive, which is why the equity part was included. Because the, in order to do that, in order to actually have a, a, a more inclusive uh, environment, work environment, school environment, because this was all, it's all about environments where people work and live and play and the corporations that do that. And so the DEI came about as that. 
Now, my view about DEI, which I find it's a funny situation to be in defending it now, so it's never effective. Uh, it, it was something corporations did. They had offices, they hired people, and a lot of the DEI came from outward sort of, of publicity, sort of like, okay, look, we're having this program or doing this. Certainly some organizations were more effective than others, but most organizations was effective. So saving DEI, which was really ineffective, seems to me to be, I mean, I know why we have to argue to save it. I know how, why we get in, have to get in front of the attempt to get rid of it, but I'd like to see something totally different because DEI wasn't, in my mind, a very effective tool. What would you like to see? What would be more effective? A new racial discrimination law that made all forms of racial discrimination illegal, inconsistent with the convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination a treaty that we refuse to sign for decades and then have minimized uh, what we have not actually emptied. As far, I don't think there's an answer for everything. I think that you have to, that, that we have to look at what is going to be effective for people who are disabled, able, what is going to be effective for people who have different religion uh, things. I think that we can't break it down. DEI, we can't do something that's going to be effect, equally effective for all groups. And so we have to do, we have to find, ask people and do something different. As far as racial discrimination, we have never, we never have had an effective racial discrimination law. And if we had an effective racial discrimination law, I think that would go towards the goals of diversity and inclusion, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But yeah, that would, is what I would like to see. We get there is another set of questions. So Jay, does DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, does that have any meaning or value for you? Uh, well, the point I'd like to make in, in the face of uh, Fenelia's comments is, is that we have a culture problem. Um, and, um, you know, the, the country doesn't see, the people in the country, 300 plus million, they don't, they, they, they see this hierarchy. Um, if you're on the top or the bottom, if you're worthy of being discriminated against in the view of lots and lots of people, then they discriminate against you. Um, and they are screwed up. They are twisted. They don't understand the human condition. They don't understand the true morality. Um, and it is a culture problem. And it started, you know, it started in, um, you know, in the 1600s, as far as slavery is concerned, and it hasn't changed. And, and uh, you can make the laws, you can make all the laws you want. It's a culture problem. Uh, so I feel that the laws cannot effectively, and I think this is the same thing Vanilla is saying, laws of any kind cannot effectively, you know, change the culture. You've got to change the culture where it lives. And that means at home, with kids, in schools, uh, and, you know, make, make uh, everything, um, you know, ac acceptable. Make 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 me not see color i don't want to see color i don't want the kids to see color i don't want to i don't want this country to, to distinguish on the basis of that hierarchy um how do we get there you know uh, well a lot of it is leadership i am reminded and this is not directly on point but i'm reminded of angela merkel uh, you know, who was faced with uh, these um, migrants coming from the Middle East and, and, and Africa. And she was completely colorblind. 
she wanted to offer a haven for them. And she, uh, you know, part of that has to do with the, 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 the guilt trip that Germany has been on about the Holocaust. But the fact is that she was colorblind. And she um, caused virtually millions of people come into Germany uh, seeking a better life. Um, now, of course, there were Germans who found that unacceptable, and you have the right wing, you know, reaction to it and all that. But let's look at Angela Merkel. That's her culture. That's the way it was, and there were a lot of people who agreed with her. And so I think we have to achieve the Angela Merkel effect where there are no scapegoats, where, you know, there is no color, uh, that, it's, that it's all acceptable. And, you know, if, if the three of us were on a desert island, just the three of us, um, you know, finding kindling wood, building a fire, um, you know, cooking fish, what have you, we'd really get to know each other. And as human beings, and we would all say, every day we would say to each other, um, hey, we're we're alive. We're together on the planet. We are people, um, and we and we need to love each other and care for each other. You you can't. You got to be decent to each other and all that. Um, you can't legislate that. That has to come from down deep, and it has to be a universal culture. So when when people like DeSantis go out and try to mess up the schools and teach it the wrong way, I say, this is really bad. It's not only bad because it accepts bad culture in Florida, um, but it, 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 it takes the culture the other way. It makes it worse. Um, so I think leaders are important. Angela Merkel was important. Um, Trump, you know, was discriminating in, with his father in, in the housing market in Queens. Um, and so, you know, he, he's clearly... A, a racially prejudiced guy. I don't know why any black would ever vote for him, but there are those that will. I tell you, um, they don't appreciate what I'm what I'm saying now. Is we all have to work to make everything equal. We all have to work to not see color, to be colorblind in every way, not just the blacks. But you know, I, I think your reference must have been to anti-Semitism, Chuck. Um, uh, it's about religion. Uh, it's about um, you know national heritage. It's about race and all of those things. We we have we we should not see the difference. We should not scapegoat. We should all see ourselves on a desert island, happy that we're alive, and happy with every human being because we have common interests as human beings. We're not there, and we're not there in this country. Um, but I think that's what we have to work for. And I think the answer is to take these kids in school and teach them every day, every day, for as long as they're in school. And it has to be public schools. I think we have to put them in a classroom and show them that the better life for everyone is to be colorblind and race blind and religion blind and all of that. I don't think that answers your question. I never really intended to answer your question, Chuck. <laughs> well, you know, uh, if I guess I would need clarification about what you mean by colorblindness, because I don't believe in colorblindness. I believe we have a society built on race. I think I agree with you that we have a culture that is built on race and color and all kinds of stuff, and that the idea... I think that we can build a society where we don't discriminate based on color and that that we allow color, the whole equity part of diversity, equity, inclusion is the idea that there are differences that are relevant and that we have to take those differences into consideration. One, uh, This is a small thing, but it, it's huge. I, for the most of my life, when I go to the hospital, they give out those damn patient packs, and in those patient packs would be those little tiny skinny combs. Those combs don't work on my hair. <laughs> you have to look at me and see that I have different hair and that I will need something different 
if it, you know, I don't know where, what you want to consider the norm. I don't, that to me is not about who's the norm. It's about recognizing that there are real differences that, that people have that need to be accounted for. Uh, it, 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 one, a difference that need to be counted for is as if you are a visible minority in a group where you that only a visible minority, color, you know, people want to believe that they're colorblind, but there's all these microaggressions. They ain't thinking I'm going to do this to you because you're black. They're not even thinking about that. But they say things and they do things. But and... what, I'm, what I'm suggesting, though, is if you catch them early, if you catch them as kids, there won't be microaggressions. Um, you, 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 would have to catch, same... you would have to catch them before the age of four. Because I, my, I, my kid, and I think even probably before that, but I remember when my son, who came home from school, he was four years old, and he came home to school crying all the time. And I finally wriggled out of him that the kids was touching his hair. And he didn't like the kids touching his hair. But the teacher thought that that would be a good learning kids for the kids to understand that different hair is just different. But that was an invasion of my, my four-year-old's privacy. And pick, he picked up a lot of way that there was a difference based on his color. He said to me once, oh, mom, he had heard that there were blacks in Africa, people the same skin color as us. And he asked me if that was true. And I said, yeah. He said, "Is he started doing that little kid thing where he wants to know, are the teachers black? Are the policemen black? I mean, I was like, if you don't stop asking me, are they black? I've told you everyone's black. And then he tilted his head and got this far out wishful thinking in his voice that made me sick at the time and still make me sick and he's in his late 40s. He said, I wish I could live there. The idea, the idea that kids, I mean, you've got parents who teach kids. I mean, it's an ideal, but I think the best ideal we can get into, the best goal that we can have is to say, yeah, we're going to try to teach people in school. And yeah, we're going to try to teach people at home. But at the end of the day, can't discriminate. We don't care how you learn to discriminate. We don't care what microaggressions. You can't do discrimination and you can't do microaggressions in the workplace, in the school. Because we're talking about institutions. So institutions could enforce this. Uh, I just don't think it's realistic to to do enough. I mean, I guess if if we could, if I could pop my finger and every parent would have the knowledge and skills necessary, then it would happen. But that's not going to happen. And so, lots of kids are going to grow up with inadequate teaching and modeling on issues of race. Yeah, and if I may, just a couple of things quickly here. Uh, um, I love the perspectives and examples that you've both given. Uh, I'm in Hawaii. <clears throat> Caucasians are a 20% minority here. We're mostly Asian Pacific, um, and we've got everything in a salad bowl. We've got kimchi and daikon and cucumbers and radishes and everything has its own colors and flavors and textures and whatever. And one of our great comedians, Rap Replinger, said, Hawaii is not a melting pot, it's a salad bowl. And I believe that. Another friend said, no, I like the beef stew metaphor, which is very, very popular here. I mean, carrots are carrots, potatoes are potatoes, the beef's the beef. So all that stuff, everything adds color, flavor, spice. 
<clears throat> but the combination is so much greater than any of the individual parts or any lesser combination of them. And it's that last part. The total combination is greater than any combination of any number of the parts. I love that. So my five-year-old kid, when I was reading to him about serious racial discrimination in urban areas of the mainland, looked up at me and he said, nah, they didn't really do that. And I told him, no, much worse than that, much more cruel, much more hostile, much more hurtful. And he looked at me with the eyes and purity of a five-year-old, shook his head and just said, stupid. And I know now at 78 what he meant. They were exercising none of the human intelligence, mental, emotional, spiritual, whatever you want to call it. None of the human intelligence to recognize and see and honor and serve the value in our differences. And my kids were Vietnamese American and their kids who combine elements of Hawaiian and Filipina and all kinds of wonderful, wonderful flavors and textures bring that. And they are intolerant of intolerance. And I love that. So not only teaching them, but giving them the opportunity to live together, put them on hypothetical desert islands. I would bring every child into a school with all of the diverse children possible. And I would have them do little role plays. You're on a desert island with these other kids who are as different from you as they can possibly be. How do you live together? How do you survive together? How do you make it work? And at the end of a week or a month or a year, how do you feel about each other? How valuable are these people to you in your life and your survival? How essential are they to the joy, to the understanding, to the dignity that you need to be a human being. That is the teaching of the experience that I believe we need. And Vernelia shared with us something. I'm gonna see if I can do it here. Hey, you have equality. Three people of different heights standing on boxes of the same height, Two of them can see the baseball game, one cannot. You have equity where they're on different boxes, but each of them is one head above the top of the fence. All of them can see the baseball game. You have reality in which one of them is on a box, a set of boxes that is disproportionately high. One is on a single box and just barely able to see the baseball game. And the other has no box and no vision of the game. And finally, the last one, liberation. There's no fence. There are no boxes. They can all see from their own height, their own place, their own environment, their own point of view. I love it. Thank you, Vernelia, for that wonderful image. It was a uh, capitalist uh, defy, showing what capitalism is, which is putting up a fence where nobody can see it. Nobody <laughs> that's not at the end of the thing is seeing it. But the equity, I think, the, thank you for sharing that. I think the whole thing, but I made a point yesterday that I think that I, I want to make again. The there has, there's going to be a redistribution of boxes at a minimum, taking down the fence at a maximum. There are going to be people who are going to be angry about that because they're going to say, why should they get to see the ball game? I paid to see the ball game. And there's going to be people who say, I got all these boxes through my hard work, through my inheritance from my parents, through whatever thing. 
These are my boxes. I actually think billionaires are hoarders. We don't talk about them in that way, but they don't need all that money. But they <laughs> hoard it like people in a house with trash. You know, you go into these houses where people are hoarders and there's trash up to the ceiling in every room and they don't want to get rid of any of it because it's all good to them. I think billionaires are the same way with their money. They, for however they got that money, they feel like they got to hold on to it. But if we was to take that money away from the billionaires, the multimillionaires, the people, if we were to tax not just income, because most billionaires don't make their money through income, but if we were to tax all forms of monies that people get and then use that taxes to us to go into something other than military, uh, we would have more than enough money to take care of people and to provide a decent living for most people in this society. Uh, we've got enough billionaires to do it. I recently think decided that they decided to make some black billionaires so people couldn't say that they're, uh, there's all the billionaires are white. But I point out to people, a billionaire is a billionaire, black or any color. <laughs> They're hoarding money. And we should take that money away from them. So let me share another image here. All right. Okay. And that is, instead of the baseball field, we have a home and a yard and a street. And you start with certain people in that home, in the comfort of that home, they have heating, they have food, they have TV, they have, they have everything they need in the home. And there are people in the street who would really, really, really like to be able to at least experience being in a home. Maybe they'll never have one. Maybe they'll never own one. Maybe they'll never get to live in one, but at least experience it for a moment, just to know that in their lifetime, they got to feel what it was like to be in a home. But the people in the home say, no, this is ours. We got this, we own it, we're entitled to it. You didn't, you aren't, you can't. That's where you start. And then you get to a point where maybe some of the people in those homes, maybe a few, Say, well, you know, it might be kind of cold out in the street. It might be kind of risky out in the street. There may be things that are, are kind of uncomfortable for us to see when we look out our windows that are happening to you in the street. So you can come into the yard. That's okay. Oh, and while you're there, cut the grass, plant some gardens, you know, make it nice for us to be able to look out our windows and enjoy and maybe there are a few, a smaller, smaller number of those people, a tiny portion of those people who say, you know, hey, it can be pretty adverse, not only out in the street, but there are some risks and, and stuff out in the yard, too. It can get pretty cold. It can get pretty rainy. It can get, you know, pretty dangerous sometimes out there. So hey, we've got a little spot in back here we got a shed you guys can stay in there if you want and maybe there's a tinier tinier tiny group of, of people who say you know we got an extra bedroom you guys can have that and maybe there's a minuscule group of people who say what the hell are you doing in the street get your butts in here it's dinner time sit down with us and whatever food we got, whatever beds we got, whatever room we got, whatever we got, it's not ours, it's not yours, it's ours. We'll figure out how to make it work for us. I remember seeing some very shocking um, video 
of fellows who cross the country and um, you know they, they, they play acted a, a situation of being destitute, of being in trouble. And when they approached people who were upper middle or even middle, nobody helped them. When they approached people who were poor, they always got helped. Uh, and it, it's you know this is not a remarkable statistic. We we all kind of know this um, that if if you're if you've experienced problems in your life, you're more likely to help the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you if you got into the one percent, you're less likely to help the other, which is really you know troubling. But I would I would like to take a moment, if I may, uh, to deal with a couple of issues you've raised. One is one is the salad bowl business in Hawaii. You know, I think Hawaii is as good as it gets, you know, in terms of bringing people together. Um, And the plantation is where they all worked together. They all enjoyed each other. They made fun of each other. Remember Frank DeLima, the comedian? And Rap. Right. Capitalized on this. It's a matter of humor. And everybody loved them. But, you know, the reality is those guys are out of business now because it hits a nerve. Um, and it's treated as a kind of discriminatory statement, and they can't do that. Um, and so you you have the you know the old problem about legislating against discrimination, and that's why you know in the in the vein of somebody talking to a young child, and and the young child says, and I'm really posing this to Vanilla, the young child says, yeah, discrimination, we should outlaw discrimination. Uh, what exactly is discrimination? Could you give me a definition of what we should be outlawing? Because there really isn't a an in-depth legal gloss to define what it is. And if you define it today, somebody will find a way around that definition tomorrow. And that we've been involved in that in that kind of yin yang sine curve um, competition. You know, you outlaw something, they find a way around it. Um, so then you outlaw that and they find a way around it. This is this is not a successful process. Um, and as Vanilia said initially, you know, we really haven't made that much progress um, if we made progress at all. And there are people who find ways around any law that you can think of that's supposed to outlaw discrimination. And I, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that because I think in the, at the end of the day, it's kind of worse, not better. Um, to do that, even though you don't have certain kinds of discrimination, you have other kinds of discrimination. Um, so, I mean, I could go on, but I, I just want to mention that I think there has to be a better way. If the three of us sat in a room or on a desert island and try to come up with a definition of discrimination, we'd be there for 40 years. And we and we'd never have to be there for out. 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> Racial discrimination, institutional racial discrimination, is when an institution has policies, practices, and procedures that have a disproportionate impact on a racial minority, a disparity, and correcting harm that was previously done is never discrimination. So you can't say, oh, my God, I'm white and being discriminated against because they're high and black. They're high and blacks because it was a harm that was previously done. It Racial disparities. We have never, you know, we like to say, and it, <laughs> uh, people, in, when I taught my race in the law class, I would say, can you discriminate in this country? And they would like, oh, no. You can't discriminate. We have laws. I say, yeah, you can discriminate in America. You can discriminate based on all kinds of reasons. And the law is so lax is that the way the law is defined, as long as you can come up with an alternative reason for doing what you're doing, you can discriminate based on race. And that's how come we have racial discrimination under the law, because the law has never outlawed it. It has permitted it more than outlawed it. And it has taught people what it what they need to do. Now, saying that people work around laws, yeah, that's true. 
People will not stop at stop points. People will go 50 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. Absolutely. But most people try to obey the law. Even when they don't understand, they stop at a stoplight and they sit there forever. When there's no cars coming, there's no cops in sight. They're in Texas so they can see 50 miles and they know that there's nothing coming. But they'll sit there till the light change. People obey the laws. My view is I, I'm not saying that do this instead of the culture changing through education. I'm saying that if you set up a cultural norm, if you set up a law that really is a strong law against racial discrimination, that most people will obey that law even when they don't agree with it. I'm talking within institutions. I'm not talking about one-on-one -on -one personal. Institutions will change because they don't want to be sued. In institution will force people in their institutions to behave. And most people will do it because they want to keep their job. Now, in my mind, it's not just my mind. I, this is something I have studied and read, and I wish I could quote an author, but I can't. What that does is set up cognitive dissonance in the person. They're obeying a law that is inconsistent with their value system. They can quit their job, but they need the job to earn money. And so what do they do? Based on the theory of cognitive dissonance, they change their values. They start providing a reason for why they don't discriminate within their workplace, even though they, in their mind, would love to discriminate. They provide a reason. Now, the problem we've had is we, we've set up the opposite. We've set up a situation where people really don't have to not discriminate and when there is one little thing that happens, they get upset because they think, oh, my God, I'm being discriminated against. I'm white and I'm being discriminated against. So I, we don't have, we've never had effective laws, never. I, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 has never been an effective law because it was allowed to be decided as intentional discrimination, Congress, despite the fact that there have been many, many Democratic Congress, they have never bothered to change that. And so the court says, hey, as long as you don't intend it, you can discriminate. And if you can offer any other explanation, we're going to say you didn't discriminate, that you didn't intend it. That's the problem with the law. I think the law has been ineffective. Now, can it do everything? No. We still need all of the stuff that you're talking about in the context of families and home and schools. But I think that we can force people down the road quicker if they have to avoid discrimination to keep their job. Before, before we go, though, I want to make two points. Uh, one is, um, you know, there there is an, a tremendous inequity in this country about about uh, wealth, as, as uh, Vernelia mentioned. And um, that is a, another flaw. I, I don't see it as necessarily a matter of discrimination. I see it as, as allowing the law to allow um, some people to achieve enor and keep for their lives and the lives of their children um, to keep wealth and to achieve enormous wealth, sort of what we try to get away from um, at, at the turn of the 20th century, you know, the rubber barons, that sort of thing, where they, and right now you can see it's in the paper every day about people who are not only billionaires, but who have enormous uh, excess in wealth. 
Yeah. And, and they have political power. So it's it's a political power issue. And I think you sort of touched on that, Vernelia, in, in terms of the racial discrimination issue. But in terms of the wealth issue, that affects everybody. Um, I mean, the 99%. And, and I really think that we have to do reform on that level. We have to we have to say, look, you cannot pass on to your progeny um, fifty billion dollars or a hundred billion. You can't do that. We're gonna we're gonna take that away, and we we are not. We're gonna close loopholes, so you you can't do that anymore. And this is mechanical. This is not difficult to define the term discrimination or um, you know uh, things that are hard to define. This is easy to define. It's numerical. Um, the problem is we have a political problem in Congress, and they're not going to do that because they're controlled by the 1% anyway, um, in terms of lobbying, in terms of Citizens United and all that. So I, I just, I just want to say I make a distinction between the equity points we've been talking about and the wealth points. On the other hand, I would leave you with the thought that if we had equity in wealth, that would help equity in racial discrimination. Because it would give more money to more people, um, and they in turn could, you know, live a better life, not be unhappy, not need to rely on scapegoatism and all that. Um, the other point I I wanted to make is that I come back after this discussion um, to the notion um, that that we we should not be stressing the differences, we should be stressing the underlying similarities the desert island similarities, if you wish. Um, I, I want to like everyone. I want to believe in everyone. Uh, I want to enjoy having human beings around me who give me nutrition. Um, I want to have, I want the whole world, you know, to be friends. That's not happening, obviously. And some would say the species is flawed because that you know doesn't happen enough but i think the focus would be to teach those kids a fundamental point and that is don't stress the differences stress the similarities stress what brings us together as human beings but acknowledge the differences requires a society that doesn't treat everybody the same that I, agree. Recognizes I absolutely that. agree with that, Vernelia. And, you know, and the smart guy who's handing out the, the care packages will have a number of different combs uh, in the package, um, recognizing the but difference. It, and, and remember, also, too, that, that I'm bald. I don't need a comb, so you don't have to provide a comb for me. So the little comb doesn't work for either one of you. That's right. <laughs> the other thing that I want to just say is... Wealth is, as I have talked, what I, as I said earlier, wealth is the, a major issue in our country. Remove it as an issue and you still have racism. You still have racism. You still have issues, uh, uh, discrimination based on race. Wealth may make fewer people who may give more, uh, wealth distribution will give more money to people and i'm for that as i've said but i would i would hate it if anybody walked away thinking that it would be a cure for racism no no i'm not saying that i'm saying it might help and i'm saying that andrew yang remember it will him help racism it will help wealth distribution mm -hmm. racism is a separate thing that has to be dealt with entirely separately so we're going to continue this in the future we're out of time for today, <clears throat> let us leave our connected people who we don't see, our viewers, our audience, anybody out there who cares about this stuff, <clears throat> with the thought that certainly we have to learn to live with each other in the workplace. That as we do that, we may learn to live with each other as human beings. Certainly, if we can do that in a way that better and more equitably distributes wealth, resources, power, that will help us live better with each other. Because 
we won't need to be as divisively, antagonistically competitive about wealth or workplace power or other power. And, and so maybe that third leg of the triangle to me is for people to live with each other and learn to live with each other. For me, it's housing. If you housed people in locations, environments, neighborhoods, whatever you want to call it, so that their ability to live well and survive and thrive depended on their being able to do that together with and for each other as needs change, as circumstances change, as resources change. That third leg with the wealth equity increase, with the learning to live with each other in the workplace, that living together in housing, in neighborhoods, in communities, maybe that could offer a model that would help motivate us to learn to see and appreciate the value of the differences in each other. That I bequeath to my Asian American kids and theirs and the ones behind. And to all of you, Think Tech Hawaii, thank you. Thank you.